This episode is brought to you by Dubby. Dubby gives you focus and energy without the crash and jitters. It has no sugar, fillers, or artificial dyes. Mix one packet or scoop into eight or 12 ounces of water. Stir or shake well. Some powderiness is normal, and it has all the important vitamins. So this has vitamin C, B3, B6, and B12. And it's made from coffee fruit extract. So drink it and go conquer a task and go to Debbie.gg and use my promo code angryblur 10 at checkout to save 10% on your order. That's Dubby.gg with promo code angryblur 10 Yo, 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 it's your boy Bernard, aka The Scarlet Spider, and welcome to another episode of The Angry Blur Podcast, where I will be discussing everything nerdy that has caught my eye over the week. So, it is the anniversary, the fifth year anniversary of Avengers Endgame. Don't have enough time to do a um, episode on that, just because there's a lot of content I need to get through. So, just notating it and had to acknowledge it. But, speaking of the MCU, let's talk about the thing that hit everybody's screens this past, what, Wednesday? And that is the Deadpool and Wolverine trailer. The full trailer, not the teaser trailer that obviously came out Super Bowl Sunday. So, we got more Wolverine because obviously that Super Bowl trailer, we only got a silhouette. And apparently we got a sense of what's going on, but not really. All we know is that Wade has been recruited by the TDA and that his world is going to die. So I think that an incursion is happening. For those of you who don't know who an incursion is, go back and rewatch Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness. And it looks like they plucked Wolverine possibly before the events of Logan where Professor X had his meltdown. Or this could be a completely different Wolverine. The only reason why I'm even going with the Logan implication is because that was what was said before. And Wade says to Logan, you let your world go to shit. But we got uh, more of Emma Corrin as Cassandra Nova. As we already confirmed like a few weeks ago because of uh, the patent office situation. But we did get a reference to Pym Falls from Old Man Logan. Uh, her base is Scott Lang Skull. <laughs> so, yeah, that's the thing. Uh, we got the traditional meeting Wolverine in the bar to recruit him with the classic Go Fuck Yourself from X-Men First Class. We got a jab at Rob Liefeld. If you go back and watch towards the end where they're doing the slow motion walk in, during the explosion around the town. There's a sign that says, uh, Liefeld's just feet. Uh, that is a poke at co-creator Rob Liefeld, who is the artist, um, who drew Deadpool. He can't draw feet. Simple as that. Uh, we obviously saw the 21st century Fox logo in the background before, but we got more detail of it. Thought I had my phone on Do Not Disturb, but let me do that right now. All right. So, Copperheads, that was in the background of that same slow motion scene as the Liefeld uh, store. So, I don't know if that's a reference to Captain America because the um, one of the villains in Captain America Brave New World is the Serpent Society. Uh, we got a possible cameo from Lady Deathstrike. Don't, well, it is Lady Deathstrike, but we don't know if it's Kelly Who. Um, we got Callisto, Toad, and a um, character named Starfish. Uh, we got a reference to Azazel. Uh, possibly Colossus. Um, it could also be the Russian who Kevin Nash played in 2004, 2003's Punisher movie, uh, that starred Thomas Jane. Cause it's just a big buff dude in a red and white striped shirt. 
Uh, we already know Pyro sitting on the car. And a lot of people also think that Kalisto is in, I mean, not Kalisto. Um, crap, what's the name of the lady who led the Morlocks? I can't remember. Uh, we got Dogpool. And, you know, we got the whole Mad Max scene with um, Toad and possibly Sabretooth. And the end of the trailer has them jumping through a sling ring made portal. So I posted on the Instagram and Facebook social media. Who do you think opened this portal? A version of Strange, Wong, or Ned? Shout out to uh, Ken, who I need to have on the podcast one of these days. Um, he said Ned. I'm like, no, 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 don't let it be Ned because that is that was a Sony choice since they decided to push this movie up. And I've talked about it multiple times. America Chavez was supposed to bring over Tobey Maguire and Andrew Garfield. But due to the fact that Sony pushed this movie up, Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness had to be rewritten. And so Ned is affluent in magic. So, yeah, um, don't forget Deadpool and Wolverine comes out July 26. Might try to go see it in a legit IMAX theater, but do I want to drive down to Fort Lauderdale and spend $30 on one movie ticket? I might have to because this is the only MCU movie that's coming out this year. I think that's the only Marvel thing outside of X-Men 97. Yeah, I think this is the only MCU thing because X-Men 97 ain't MCU, guys. Sorry to burst the bubble. All right. Speaking of burst bubbles, Superman and Lois has wrapped up filming on season four, which is the final season. So at the time of this recording, three days ago, they finished their uh, final season. They had their rap party. And on the bottom of the final call sheet, um, Bitsy Tulick, who plays Lois Lane, posted this. It said to the best cast and crew in television. Thank you for four seasons of tireless dedication, endless enthusiasm, and your massive talent in making Superman and Lois one of the best adaptations of the Superman mythology. And that is a personal note from Todd Helberg, Brent Fletcher, Gregory Smith, Lisa Lewis, Ian Somali, Somali and Melissa Critch. So, yeah, it, it sucks that the show is ending due to the fact that, you know, the CW, um, well... Warner Brothers sold their, their shares of the CW. Don't know if uh, CBS still has their portion, but you can tell that the network is pretty much going downhill because now only thing they do is show Netflix shows that they've optioned and religious shows and like a bunch of reality shows that nobody wants. Yeah, I mean, this really was one of the best interpretations of Superman, like a fully adult Superman. I'm not talking Smallville is his own thing because that's from him being a boy to becoming a man. But Lois and Clark, nah. George Reeves Superman was all right, but it's pretty dated. Um, we already know how I feel about the Snyderverse. Uh, having Clark Kent snap somebody's neck, nah. But. They did show uh, the first episode in the final season. It's titled The End and the Beginning. And hopefully it will be released uh, by fall of this year. But, man, it sucks. It was really a good show. Tyler Heckman did his thing as Clark Kent. Um, the three boys who played the twins did a good job as... Um, Jonathan and, um, crap, what was his other son's name? What was his other son's name? Jonathan and, um, Jordan. Because he's named slightly after jor -El. But all good things must come to an end, unfortunately. All right. Next story. So, for you guys who are fans of Sony films, I got some bad news for you. So Sony, well, I might have good news and bad news. So Sony has pushed back Craven the Hunter and the Karate Kid uh, late Friday afternoon. 
So, Craven the Hunter has been moved from August 30th, 2024 to December 13th, 2024, which was supposed to be the release date for uh, the Ralph Macchio, Jackie Chan, Ben Wang, and other cast members who I can't remember besides Ming Nan Wen, Karate Kid movie. And so that is now going from December of this year to May 30th of next year. So one of the reasons why people are thinking this is the delay for the Karate Kid, no reason for Craven really, is because of Cobra Kai. Because we don't know when the final season of Cobra Kai is going to be done or when it's being released. But we do know that it has to free up the character of Daniel LaRusso. Otherwise, it's just going to be kind of like a Wolverine in comic book situation. Like, how is he in two places at once? It also appears that the Lord of the Rings, the War of the Rohim, will also be coming out on December 13th. And something else. Oh, that's what it was. Um, Animal Friends is supposed to be coming out on August 15th, 2025 as well. And that stars Ryan Reynolds, Jason Momoa, Aubrey Plaza, Daniel Levy, Laurel Howery, Addison Ray, and Ellie Bamber. And this is a R-rated live action animation hybrid. So I guess who framed Roger Rabbit on crack? Maybe. I have no idea who Ellie Bamber is. She's 27. She, oh, okay. She was on the Willow show. Didn't watch it. She was also in Nocturnal Animals. I didn't see anything she's in, apparently. Because I don't think anybody saw the Nutcracker in the Four Realms. Um, and Addison Ray, the name sounds familiar, but I don't think I've seen anything with her in it. Oh, she was in Thanksgiving. So, I didn't. Saw that. All right. Some more Sony stuff. Sony has got the rights to Clue. So the board game that was once turned into a movie back in the 1980s that starred Tim Curry, Madeline Kahn, and Christopher Lloyd. Still haven't seen it, Loco. Leave me alone. Um, apparently, before Sony got the rights, Ryan Reynolds was supposed to um, be in a reboot of the fan franchise. But now that Sony has it with their deal with Hasbro, they are going to be doing a Clue TV show and a Clue movie. I've never been a fan of the board game. That might be the reason why I've never seen the movie, but I do like a good murder mystery. I like Knives Out. I like Glass Onion, despite the fact that Ryan Johnson sold it to Netflix. And now I can't get the second movie to go on my damn shelf. <sighs> so, sell the seven seeds. For that one, because Netflix, nah. I'm good on Netflix. But, I mean, maybe I'll watch it. Maybe I won't. I don't know yet. All right. So, speaking of Netflix, Wednesday has had a few casting updates uh, over the past few weeks. Uh, the first one that came out was Steve Buscemi has joined the cast of season two. No idea on who he's playing yet, but that's all we know so far is that Steve Buscemi will be joining the cast. Maybe he will be. Oh, um, rumor is that he is going to be playing the new principal of Nevermore Academy. So here's my question with that. Is this going to be like Harry Potter in the defense against the dark arts teacher? Like every year, like the principal is going to get replaced. And how many years is the show going to go? I really feel like they can only maybe squeeze four years out of this show because I've never more as a high school. And that's if they're lucky, they can squeeze four. I mean, uh, five out. So I think really they're going to stop at four. I don't know. Unless, like, they, they start to split it up where it's like, oh, you know, this season is the first half of the semester, and the season three is, like, half of her sophomore year. I don't know. But, yeah, so Steve Buscemi would be joining the cast, rumored to be the principal. 
And Fandy Newton, who I know from Crash, and I believe she was in Chronicles of Riddick. Uh, apparently, she was in Mission Impossible 2. She was in 2012, The Pursuit of Happiness. She played Will Smith's wife. Uh, Norbert, uh, who she played Eddie Murphy's love interest. Uh, she was on Westworld. I believe she was in Crash. She was in Solo Star Wars Story. Yeah, I was right. She was in the Chronicles of Riddick. Um, she will be joining the cast as well. Her role has been kept under wraps, so no one has been able to figure out who she's playing. Maybe she'll be playing um, Uncle Fester's new girlfriend because uh, Fred Armisen did get bumped up to a series regular. I don't know. Um, if you guys are going to watch Wednesday, let me know. I plan on watching it because... Uh, shout out to Al Go and Miles Miller, creators of Smallville, creators of Wednesday. Also wrote Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice. So I will definitely be reviewing that when that comes out as well. So um, speaking of things I need to review, Sonic 3. Uh, Toby Asher, who is the producer on that and um, the showrunner on Knuckles, said that Sonic 3 is going to be a incredible movie that's giant and fun and takes a lot of the plot of Sonic Adventure 2. So, can't wait for that because Sonic Adventure 2, out of all the Sonic games from the 3D era, is possibly the best one. And it's, and it's been, they've been struggling to recapture that energy. Like Sonic Adventure 1 and 2 are both good. Uh, it kind of went downhill after that. Like Sonic Forces is. Okay, uh, I don't even think I beat Shadow the Hedgehog. No, I did beat Shadow the Hedgehog. But the problem with Shadow the Hedgehog is I believe it had like 15 different endings. So it's just like, I get it. They were, they were, they were, you know, trying to milk that game for all it's worth. Like I said last week, they gave him a gun and a motorcycle. Um, but yeah, I mean, you got to go big when Shadow the Hedgehog is in here. And the simple fact that, you know, they got Keanu to be shadow, you know, despite how I feel about all these Hollywood actors, you know, taking all the voice work from, you know, people who only get to work in like anime and video games. Like, like the only person in Sonic who has done work in video games is Colleen O'Shaughnessy. Shaughnessy. And that's because she is the voice of Tales from, I believe, Sonic Adventure. Looking this up real quick. Colleen O'Shaughnessy. Because Ben Schwartz, he's done. He, he he was a live action actor first, but then he went to uh, do the voice of, I believe he did Dewey on DuckTales. And obviously Invincible. Oh, um, he also did one of the voices for Bumblebee on. Okay, Ben Schwartz. Well, he started doing live action, but he's done voice of work before he was in Turbo. He was the voice of Skidmark. Um, he was one of the voices for Bumblebee and Transformers Age of Extinction. I forgot he was um, BB-8. Well, he was a voice consultant on that. Uh, he was in the Lego Movie 2. The second part, still haven't watched it. Uh -huh. Oh, he was in, he did Charm Uprising as well. Uh, but Colleen O'Shaughnessy has done work in anime uh, animation, uh, which is American animation, obviously, um, film, like he's done voices for Digimon, the movie, Baruto, Bleach, Cars, Sailor Moon, video games, Bleach as well, Disney Infinity 3.0, EverQuest, Final Fantasy 7 Remake, Final Fantasy 13, 13 Part 2, Fire Emblem. So yeah, she's really the only person from like that, that wheelhouse of just like, you know, doing the voices of all the characters from video games and anime that we like. Like she's, she's basically a Tara strong. Like I'm trying to think who maybe they could have got Christopher Sabat, or maybe he wanted too much. And that's the voice of Vegeta, by the way, if you don't know, but I don't know, but come on December, hurry up and get here so I can watch Sonic three. I really need a trailer. Cause I need to hear Keanu's shadow voice. Don't just do his, um, don't do the John Wick voice and don't do the, um, what's the voice? Uh, Keanu and speed. I'm the ultimate life form. 
Shadow, the Hedgehog. All right. Uh, some of y'all's favorite app, TikTok, uh, has been banned. Joe Biden said, um, um, you have, uh, you have three months. I'm sorry. What does that say? You have nine months to sell your, your, your app to a U.S. Uh, company or, or, or you'll be banned. And the president of Bike Dance said that Bike Dance does not have any plans to sell TikTok. So it was basically two days after Biden signed the TikTok diverse or ban measure in the law. And Xiao Z Chu said in a video posted on TikTok that said the facts in the Constitution are on our side. And he said he expects TikTok to prevail again. Um, and that's in reference to Montana's failed effort to ban the app. Um, a Virginia senator, uh, Mark Warner, said the idea that we would give the Communist Party this much of a propaganda tool, as well as the ability to scrape 170 million users, American users' uh, personal data, it is a national security risk. Um, I've already said my piece about TikTok. I don't want to use the app because I don't need another app stealing my data. Uh, keep in mind the farms or servers for TikTok US are in Texas. It is um, a possibility that they could be hacked by the Chinese government, I believe. But the CEO said, you know, we keep our security protocols up to date to keep your information safe and secure. Keep in mind, TikTok has already been banned in some countries. So um, it has partial or full bans in some countries, such as India, which it has been banned in since 2021. And basically, Canada is the only country where there's a partial ban. So if you work for the federal government of Canada, you cannot have the app on your phone that is government issued. But like I said, if it, if it gets banned, it gets banned. Um, honestly, I'm over the whole social media thing. I barely post on my personal Instagram. I barely tweet. I only use Facebook to promote the Angry Blurred podcast. You rarely see a updated post from me or anything like that. I mean, I just posted that I got a uh, three zero white ranger figure you guys can't see it because i blurred my background but it's that thing that's sitting on the table like right there <laughs> uh, it finally got delivered but hey man i guess they don't know about a little thing called vpns so yeah people will find a way to uh, work around it i don't know because i don't really think you can because like that's what people in other countries are doing. They're using VPNs to access TikTok, but I don't know. So that's that. Uh, <clears throat> they said they ain't selling. So <laughs> he basically killed Leo DiCaprio in the Wolf Wall Street. I'm not leaving. I'm not fucking leaving. <laughs> The show goes on! This is my home! They're gonna need a fucking wrecking ball to take me out of here! Alright, Tom, why does this website never let me work? There we go. Never scrolls the first time I uh, access it. Tom Holland was talking about Spider-Man and plans for the fourth movie. So, he was at the Sands Festival uh, the Sands International Film Festival in Scotland. He was there to support his brother, um, uh, Harry, who is also, um, who also works in film. He directed and co-wrote a movie called Blackbird. So yeah, uh, they were asking him, you know, yeah, he, instead of asking him about his brother's movie, they're just like, Tom, 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 Tommy, Tommy, Tom. Tom, uh, what's going on with the full Spider-Man movie, bro? And he said the simple answer is that I'll always want to do Spider-Man films, 
Um, I owe my life and career to Spider-Man. So the simple answer is yes, I'll always want to do more. And he said the complicated answer is how he and the Spider-Man team approach any following, uh, any follow up to Spider-Man No Way Home. He said we have the best in the business working toward what that story might be. But until we crack it, we have a legacy to protect. The third movie was so special in so many ways that we need to make sure we do the right thing. And he said that this is the first time in the process that he's been part of the creative team so early. It's a process with, that he's watching and learning. And it's just really it's a really fun stage for me. Um, like I said, everyone wants it to happen, but we want to make sure we're not overdoing the same things. I can honestly say. I respect that. So, yeah, you, last thing you want to do is go about the curse of the Spider-Man properties, and that's oversaturate your film with multiple villains. So this is the first one that it made sense. We didn't need uh, um, Topher Grace to become Venom in uh, Spider-Man 3. That could have been saved for the fourth movie. Could have, like, stretched out that Sandman stuff. A little bit longer. You could have stressed out him and Harry, you know, beefing a little bit more. Um, Amazing Spider-Man 2. Didn't need Dane, uh, Dane DeHaan becoming a goblin. Yeah, and you just went ahead and just like pushed the death of Gwen Stacy like too fast. I mean, bro, her dad just died in the first one. So as long as they're working with Marvel, it could, I feel like it's uh, the Spider-Man franchise is in the right hands. Now, everything that's Spider-Man adjacent, Outside of the animated Spider Verse movies, Madam Web, Garbage, Cave the Hunter, I'm scared. Venom, horrible. Um, Morbius, what the hell was that? No, 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 we good on those. All right. So, like I said, this is a franchise that I've never bothered to watch, which I, I might have to give it a shot. I mean, I've never had an issue with it, I just never got around to watching it. And that is the uh, 28 Blank Later franchise. And the reason why I said Blank is because the first one was 28 Days Later. And what was the second one? 28 Weeks Later? Double checking. Yeah. 28 Weeks Later. And now 28 Years Later. Uh, it's coming out. And we got some casting news for that. So Danny Boyle is set to direct this one. Apparently it's co-written by Alex Garland, who did Civil War. And he directed... Um, he might have wrote Ex Machina as well. I'm not sure. But Aaron Taylor Johnson, Ralph Fiennes, and uh, Jody Comer are set to star in this movie. I don't think I've ever seen anything with Jodie Comer in it. I know her name. But, oh, yeah. What am I talking about? She was in Free Guy. Every time I see her name, the first thing I think of is Killing Eve. I'm like, I ain't seen no damn uh, Killing Eve. But, yeah, she was in um Free Guy. So not much has been given about this movie with the exception of the um, uh, three people I have said were cast. And apparently they're going to be doing this, um, doing another movie after this. And it's rumored that Naya or Nia, I don't know, um, the Costa will be taking over for the second part of this new trilogy and for those of you who don't know who Nia DaCosta is she directed the Marvels I know y'all hate it and she also directed uh Candyman which came out in what 2021 2022 when did Shang-Chi come out because I saw them back to back um uh, 2021 dang that was three years ago all right all we know is that it gives zombie vibes I thought it was vampires for some reason don't know, but yeah, it's a biohazard. Uh, the first one came out in 2002, and it was 28 Days Later. And that one centered around uh, Killian Murphy, who played a bicycle courier named Jim, who um, traveled from London to Manchester after he awoke from a coma. Um, after being in a coma for one month, um, and he woke up to an infected invasion. And 28 weeks later, obviously, just shows... Um, Everything that's happened six months after the first one, and that one centered around um, Robert Car Carlyle, uh, who played Don and his family. I think I know Robert Carlyle from, um, what's the name of the Samuel L. Jackson movie? No one saw Formula 51. Uh, let's look this up real quick. Apparently, he, okay, he was also in The Full Monty. Um, he was on Once Upon a Time. Oh, okay. See, 
the issue with this movie is it's got two different names depending on where it was. Um, in the UK, it was released as the 51st State. Very good movie if you haven't seen it. Oh, I forgot Emily Mortimer was in that. But one of these days, I'm going to get around to watching those movies. Don't know how soon, but I'll get to it when I get to it. It ain't going nowhere, okay? All right. Speaking of movies, Superman uh, 2025 update. Nathan Fillion, who we know from the rookie castle, uh, being um, the fan cast for Nathan Drake and Uncharted, uh, Firefly, uh, the Suicide Squad, being one of James Gunn's best friends because he's been in every single James Gunn movie in some way, shape, or form. Super, Slither, uh, all three Guardians movies, well, not Guardians 2 because they cut him out of that one. Um, being the animated voice of Hal Jordan in the MC, I mean, the DC AU, AU, EU, I don't know, the animated films that started with Justice League War. They had their own um, franchise going on over there, but then they kind of scrapped it. All right, so he was doing what they, um, he was doing an interview with Collider, and he described his take on Guy Gardner as a man who's 90% flawed, but doesn't care. And so he said, the reality is that people, the reality is that people have flaws. We all have quirks. We all have vulnerabilities. You can have the most wonderful family, but be like, oh my God, my dad drives me nuts. He got this one thing. Everybody's got something and I love to lean on those faults and flaws. It's what makes people real and what allows audiences to relate because we all know um, what that is. We all have our own. We, we witness it with other people. Guy Gardner is 90% flawed and doesn't care. And that's one of his major flaws. I think it's a real freedom in playing that. So for a guy who likes to play flaws and flawed people, Guy Gardner is a gold mine. Is he going to have the bowl cut or is he going to have the modern haircut? Please don't let Nathan Fillion be out here rocking a gold, uh, a bowl cut because that man is what, 50 years old now? 53. Yeah. Don't, don't give him no bowl cut. And that would be very weird. Like after he goes and, uh, shoots it's the rookie. But yeah, nah. So Superman 2025, I believe, comes out in July. Uh, let's double check. Superman. Yeah, July 11th, 2025. So we will be keeping a lookout on that. Stars David Corns clip as Superman. Rachel Brosnahan as Lois Lane. Isabel Merced as Hawk Girl. Um, Edie Gaptegui as Mr. Terrific. Nathan Fillion, as I said, as Guy Gardner. Anthony Kerrigan as Metamorpho. Maria Gabriela de Farana as the engineer. Sarah Sampario as Eve Tessmacher, Skylar Gazando as Jimmy Olsen, Nicholas Holt as um, Lex Luthor, Wendell Pierce as Perry Wright, uh, Pruitt Taylor Vince as Jonathan Kent, and Neva Howell as uh, Martha Kent, and then Millie Alcock is supposed to be having a cameo as Supergirl, and uh, the one that, that pissed everyone else off, Sean Gunn, is Maxwell Lord. All right. So I'm going to get into my breakdown review of Abigail. All right. Let me get the information first. Huh. Okay. So apparently, is this done by Universal? Yeah, it was. All right. So apparently Abigail is based on in a reimagination of the 1936 Universal Classic Monsters film, Dracula's Daughter. And this film follows a group of kidnapper, uh, kidnappers who capture the daughter of a powerful underlord and demand $50 million for her release, unaware that the young girl is actually a vampire. All right. Um, directed by Matt Bertinelli Open and Tyler Gilpin. Um, I believe, what is their name? They have a, they have a, um, they have a stage name together. What is it? Um, cause they directed Scream. Radio Silence. That's what it was. Yeah. Um, Radio Silence Productions. They also did, uh, VHS, Devil's Due, Southbound, Ready or Not, VHS 94. And they also did Scream 5. Oh, and, um, I messed up last week when I said that Melissa Burrell was in Scream 7. She was fired from Scream 7. She was in 5 and 6. All right. Um, they're also doing a, a new version of Escape from New York. All right, cool. But 
So, yeah, uh, written by Guy Busick and Stephen Shields, stars Melissa Barrera, Dave, Dan Stevens, Catherine Newton, Will Collette, Kevin Durant, Angus Cloud, uh, Alicia Weir, and Giancarlo Esposito. So, I did not know Alicia Weir was Irish. Should have known with that name, but she did a good job of hiding her accent. All right, so... Bro, this movie was good. Um, and they filmed it in Ireland, apparently. Um, my only issue with this movie was I really didn't notice it because I was blind to it. When I sent this trailer, well, I sent trailer two to Three Shades. It showed a lot that wasn't in trailer one. So I more or less, I pretty much knew that she was a vampire and that was it. Um. But yeah, man, this movie was good. Melissa Barrera did her thing as Joey. Dan Stevens did his thing as uh, Frank. Will Collette, who I know from Black Lightning. I believe he was old soul in Lovecraft Country. Yeah, he was in the episode when they went back to 1921. He played Lala on Black uh, Lightning. Uh, Captain Newton from uh, Freaky and Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania. And Sammy, Kevin Durand uh, as Peter. Angus Cloud, R.I.P. As Dean uh, and Gian Carlo Esposito, who barely had anything to do in the movie. He was like in the movie for maybe like 20 minutes. Also, happy belated birthday to him. He turned 66 on the 26th. And Matthew Good played uh, Dracula. <laughs> Call him Dracula. He was Dracula. All right. So I like. I have a love hate relationship with some movies that take place in one setting. And this is one of the movies that I loved. I think I made only like one or maybe like two or three movies like that. And it's this one buried. And I really can't think of another one. I would have to like see what movies take place. Oh, phone booth. That's the third one. Um, like you start somewhere, but the majority of the movie is just in one other place. Um, so yeah, I mean, um, I really feel like Angus Cloud's character had to be uh, cut down because of his passing. Cause in the first trailer, he's shown in a lot more scenes than what he is in this film. Uh, the practical effects were amazing. They used a lot of prop blood. Hold on a second. People calling me when I'm recording. Yeah. And it seemed like everyone had fun on the set um, from the press junkets I was looking at. Like they had um, Melissa and um, Alicia. Um, doing um some some press junkets, and they were talking about how much fun they had, and they were talking about uh one of Alicia's favorite scenes was where she gets hit by sunlight, and her and her arm blows off, and she talked about like doing the green screen thing, and how they um attach like a prosthetic forearm to basically do the Deadpool thing, where her hand is starting to grow out the uh the stub, and you know they were talking about like how how it was so much fun, but I mean, like I, said, I really can't say anything bad about this movie. This movie was amazing. I really hope it makes all of this money because everyone's like, oh, you know, I was actually arguing with some dumbass on Instagram a few days ago where he was talking about, oh, you know, nobody cares about movies anymore. Um, it's all about the MCU. I'm like, my dude, Civil War, which came out like three weeks ago, was like the number one movie for the past two weeks. And I'm like, there's been other movies that have come out that have, you know, been number one or like have been in that slot outside of a Marvel movie release. So it's like, go see Abigail. Like the movie has made $20 million so far. It came out a week ago. The budget is 28. We need to get to at least what? 50, 66. Yeah. Yeah. 66. No, 56. What am I talking about? 28 times two. Yeah, 56. Tripping. But um, yeah, very and very good movie. So can we please go and support this movie? Uh, I feel like Melissa Barrera is coming for her uh, fake sister, uh, Jenna Ortega's crown as the screen queen, because it seems like she's also leaning into the um the uh the the horror franchises. 
because apparently um, after Scream 5, she did a movie called Bed Rest that came out in 2022. Um, oh, oh, okay, this is a romantic horror comedy that is coming out uh, called Your Monster. Let's see if this even has a release date or if it had already come out yet. It came out in Sundance um, this past January. But we'll see if this one actually gets a theatrical release. And never mind, that's a biography. But yeah, I mean, I really don't have anything bad to say about this movie. Go see it. Um, Kevin Durand, who I said last week, he played Blob in X-Men Orders Wolverine. That might be the only movie a lot of people know him from. He also played Carlos in The Butterfly Effect. He was also in, um, he was in Resident Evil Retribution. Didn't watch it, but yeah, um, Dark Angel didn't watch that either. Uh, he played Little John in the Russell Crowe Robin Hood movie. Oh, I forgot he was in Smoking Aces, but um, yeah, he did a good job playing a big buff idiot. <laughs> so, yeah, y'all go check out Abigail, okay? Don't be one of those people that are like, oh, you know, I'll just wait until it, it, it hits streaming because then. Cause those would be the same people who be bitching about movies, not you know, you know, it's not it's it it's it's not worth going to see. It's not worth going to see, bro. But anyway, um, let me get in my review of um X Men ninety seven. All right, guys, um, here's the breakdown for X Men ninety seven episode seven, titled Bright Eyes, directed by Emmy Emmett Yanamura and written by Charlie Feldman and J V Ballard. The X-Men hold the funeral for Gambit while Rogue goes on a hunting spree for Trask and um uh, Bol uh Bolivar Trask and Henry Gyrick. Um we get cameos from Thunderbolt Ross and Captain America who try to stop her, but she outmaneuvers them by finding Gyrick in Mexico City with a little bit of help from Cap after she yeeted his shield up into the mountains. Um uh, the rest of the X-Men arrive on Genosha to help with the recovery mission and end up finding Emma Frost who has activated her new diamond form. Um, meanwhile, Roberto is being pressured by Jubilee to tell his mother that he is a mutant because what if they were there and what if her mom doesn't get the full story of why he was on Genosha in the first place? So those two go to Genosha. He tells his mom that she he, that he's a mutant. She's like, we knew. Okay. You don't burn down three houses and, you know, who who really thought you were, you know, who really thought the yacht was burnt down by Somalian priors? She said cap, but we ain't telling this. No, nope, keep this in the house and you got to distance yourself away from the X-Men because the shareholders don't really rock with mutants because, you know, the family's rich. Meanwhile, um, um, Morph calls the X-Men back on Genosha to Trask calling them because he says he wasn't responsible for what happened on Genosha and that he's in Madripoor and they find Rogue in Mexico. I guess their communicators are also GPS locators. So big brother for X-Men, but whatever. So they go to Madripoor and find out that he's been working on an updated Sentinel. Trash kills Rogue, but then he returns to life as a hybrid Sentinel and Cable time slides in to help the team and Tells Gene to get out of his head because you ain't her. And that's when Scott realizes that Cable is little baby Nathan. He's like, look, man, we can we can catch up on the family reunion later. We got shit to do. But also it is revealed that Bastion has been working with Sinister, Trask, and Gyrick. And surprise, Magneto's not dead. But we don't know what they're doing with him yet. And they also reveal, well, um, Bastion reveals to sinister that the X-Men lied to the public and Professor X is in space. So there have been Easter eggs for Bastion all along. And by all along, I mean in episode four, uh, the life death segment, not the Motendo, where Forge is explaining the storm about everything um, that's been going on and how he worked with the government. It was a picture of Forge and a few other individuals, but you do get to see a little purple. Well, not a little He's not uh, Chris Elliott in Scary Movie 2. You get you see a purple hand, but you don't get to see the rest of the body. So I knew it was Bastion 
as soon as they showed him with Gyric, when Gyric didn't have his glasses on, because I saw the goatee, I saw the purple skin. Uh, Bastion wears a very particular suit or uniform, because I don't know if it's uh, considered a costume or not. And I'm like, oh God. So Theo James is providing the voice of Bastion. And he was saying, oh, you know, I'm going to be doing the voice of a character that's well loved. I don't know nobody who loved Bastion. This is, you know, where my hatred from Bastion came in? He killed Nightcrawler. He killed Nightcrawler in um, Second Coming, Messiah Complex. Um, I can't remember. It was one of those. All right. Let me look up when did Nightcrawler die. Not when did Nightcrawler come out. All right. Yeah. When did Nightcrawler die? Yeah. Second Coming. Um, so I'm gonna give y'all a quick rundown of Bastion, who is the anti-mutant master of Sentinels. And this is coming from Marvel. All right. So as a mastermind behind the anti-mutant attacks like Operation Zero Tolerance, Bastion has acted as a key general in the war on mutants. He drafted unsuspecting humans to become his merciless prime sentinel. Sentinels orchestrated the death of some of X-Men's most iconic members and turned long dead enemies into present day threats. All right, Bastion debuted as a mystery lingering around the edges of the X-Men world, just as the darkest aspects of Professor X and Magneto involved, evolved into the villainous onslaught and began attacking the Marvel Universe. Bastion surfaced in X-Men issue 52, which came out in 1991. But his first full appearance was in Uncanny X-Men issue 333. Um... And that was written by Scott Lobdell and drawn by Pascal Ferry. Bast Bastion was already trying to sell, gov um, sell go government officials on our Operation Zero Tolerance, his plan for a worldwide crackdown on mutants. Although his true origin remains a mystery from some time, Bastion is a fusion of the Master Mode, a sentinel that builds other sentinels, and Nimrod, an endlessly adaptable sentinel from the future. After Master Mode absorbed Nimrod and was pushed through a mystical portal called the Siege Perilous, Bastion emerged on the other side with a human appearance, transformed into an amnesiatic sentinel hybrid with super strong, with a super strong cybernetic body and the ability to interface with and control various types of technology. After he was taken in kindly by Rose Gilberti and given the name Sebastian, he fell in with the mutant hating groups like the Friends of Humanity. So, yeah, my first appearance of uh, my first history with Bastion was uh maybe like 15 years ago uh during the whole x-men second coming thing i didn't know who this guy was because i didn't read comics um until like the mid-2000s and i really didn't get into x-men comics until after house of m where wanda maxwell lost her mind and said no more mutants pretty much wiped out 99.9 percent .9 of mutants there was literally 198 of them left so i'm just like wow so we got three episodes left and honestly i really don't know how they going you know um i mean they're obviously going to keep this like shocked every single week but bro um between rogue basically going full super saiyan can we get rogue some goggles because i know her flying at breakneck speed she getting dirt and stuff all in her eyes because rogue is not the type to have a force field that just burns everything up like before it touches her um it was good getting a cameo from captain america everyone's like oh my god it's connected to the mcu now it is not connected to the mcu so x-men exists x-men 97 exists in an animated universe where a few things were connected and that was um and spider-man was the central uh figure of that universe because everyone appeared on spider-man no one outside of captain america ever appeared on x-men captain america only appeared on one episode of x-men where wolverine was it was a wolverine centric episode where he remembered um he went to go see a friend who passed away um during world war ii well he met in world war ii and but yeah so we got bastion uh thunderbolt ross for those of you who don't know is the Hulk's biggest hater of all time. I mean, you should know who Thunderbolt Ross is. He was in the Incredible Hulk. And um, he was played by the late, great William Hurt, who is 
been replaced by Harrison Ford for Captain America Brave New World. Forget it, but I don't like, man. So, Bastion got Magneto and just killed like Leech and the other Morlocks who um, Magneto was protecting. I'm like, wow. Like, I know Bastion is a piece of shit, but come on, man. Ah, good grief. Well, we got three episodes left. Hopefully Storm shows up in the next episode. I don't want to wait for Storm to show up at, like, at the last minute and like save the day in episode 10. But that's probably what's going to happen. But anyway, guys, this is Bernard, a.k.a. The Scarlet Spider. That was another episode of the Angry Blurred Podcast. Be sure to rate, review, subscribe, tell a friend to tell a friend and go to w.gg and use my promo code angryblur 10 at checkout to save 10% on your order next week. Because, like I said, can't really celebrate the fifth anniversary of Avengers Endgame because I've been talking for an hour already. Um, I have to review Knuckles and Boy Kills World. So I will see y'all next week. See ya.